our first uh, panelist and also our chair. He is the founder of um, the Lunar Constructors Incorporated, Kevin Green, and he will start the panel. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have to thank Jeff Feige for giving me the, you know, the finest speaking spot in the whole conference following what we just had up here. Thanks, Jeff. Really good. Uh, yeah, my name is Ken Green. I'm a civil engineer. I've um, been working for uh, well, several decades in infrastructure and seismic retrofit projects of all kinds. I uh, spent about eight years in the offshore oil industry early in my career, which uh, led to living, you know, very interesting places like London and Norway, uh, designing really for that time very cutting edge structures in deep water in places like the North Sea. It's a very challenging environment. And then for about uh, another years working on uh, big infrastructure projects, mostly in California and in a lot of seismic retrofit. And about 92, I started going to the, uh, my professional society, ASCE, has been holding conferences continuously on space engineering construction since 1988. And that series continues through. We, we just held our 10th uh, such conference this year. I started attending those in 92 and just one step after another got roped into this world because obviously this is where the future is. And then about 99, wandered into one of the meetings of the Space Frontier Foundation and uh, found my true home. Uh, with me today are two of the, and I'm now in the executive committee of the Aerospace Division that oversees those conferences. And with me today are two other members of our executive committee. Uh, Professor Sankaran Mahadevan from Vanderbilt University and Vislav Binyenda from the University of Akron. And uh, they'll be, we're, we're working on a strategic plan within our division to uh, hopefully and engage the members of our society who are scattered through, you know, a, a host of companies, large and small. Uh, ASCE is one of the, I think the oldest and one of the largest professional societies in this country. Uh, there's 140,000 dues-paying members at the moment, uh, mostly in the U.S., and they do all kinds of work that's, all kinds of skill sets are going to be useful as this whole frontier starts to become real. And uh, some of our strategic plan will be presented by, uh, by Maha and, and in a presentation just following. First, I want to go over so just, some, uh, just some simple questions and outline point of view, just from the point of view of a civil engineer who's been looking at this for quite a while. Because any civil engineer who starts to get involved in this kind of thing, or any large facility project, like for example, Bechtel was hired to do a whole city in Saudi Arabia in the 70s, you may have heard about. You know, Saudi said, well, we need a city over here on the coast. We don't just need a refinery, we need a city. So if you, Bechtel, could just do the whole thing for us, and get us we'd, we'll pay you for it. So uh, it's, it's not exactly a novel idea for our profession to plan out and accomplish, and help clients to accomplish very large and complex enterprises. Uh, this is very different than the focus of, uh, you know, primarily structural engineers working in the aerospace company who are much more technically focused on the analysis and, you know, of flight structures. Uh, civil engineers out in the world, um, out in the practicing world on working on infrastructure and facility development get involved in a much broader range of issues including, you know, the financing and organization of projects and the control. And so these are just the basic questions we would ask about anything, and I think they're very pertinent to this lunar facility, the, the lunar facilities. If I can back up to that, I'm not quite ready to jump forward. Uh, you know, these are just the basic questions we would go over. What are the purposes to be served? How durable? Uh, how's it going to get paid for? Uh, who is the owner? Who's the client? Um, next one. And the unexamined assumptions will really trip us up, and I, I, I tossed this together somewhat before some of the recent panels and conferences, but I think these, as Wendell said, within NASA, there's still some of these false models float, floating around. Uh, you know, there are some people in NASA who have a very clear idea, as we just heard, but uh, there's some, these are actual comments that, you know, you can, you could hear from people within NASA as recently as our, um, our recent space engineering and construction conference in Houston in March of this year, that the model for uh, the lunar base NASA's lunar base will be South Pole Station, which is an all-government, you know, operation. Uh, I, a little contentious there, talking about flaky economics. We at NASA will build a highway so others can use it. Well, we've heard about that, and we're going to hear more about that all, all this weekend. And a very unworkable process, which has already been tried and failed on the space station, which is first, we'll build a NASA base, and then we'll commercialize it. 
please. So what's a model that can work? Well, we've already had heard, you know, NASA held this very useful exploration strategy workshop earlier this year, and from seven of the eight groups, they heard back a very clear message that they need to base it on sustainable economics, settlement, economic development. The Aldrich Commission, and I hope I spelled this name correctly, also uh, gave that direction very clearly on implementing the President's vision, which is use the private sector for everything feasible. Use NASA's own forces only for things proven to be unobtainable from private sources. There was a bar set there that has not been followed. So we're talking about real settlement here, not just exploration. Next, please. And Wendell spoke quite a bit to this, and in fact, uh, Wendell Mandel spoke very clearly on this at uh, a conference in Albuquerque about a year and a half ago, that what does NASA really need on the moon? The main thing NASA needs is, beyond going there and practicing to go to Mars, is they need an exit strategy, too. They need a way to get back out of the moon. They, they look, you know, they, if um, anyone who looks at this sees that, for example, the trouble the Department of Defense is having getting out of bases they occupied to win World War I, II and Korea, and they can't close the bases yet. You know, the latest BRAC round that went through last year, uh, there, was a, there was a serious editing back from, from the initial list. So that aims us towards the direction of NASA being an anchor tenant, not the developer and not the primary operator. Basic principle here being that if you don't build it or own it, you don't have to stay there. Next, please. If we're going to talk about sustainable economics, then we, we, we look at creating a real economic, you know, ec economies like ecosystems. They grow and they evolve. They have to have diversity. They have to have, you know, various niches. You've got to have the small operators and the big operators. Uh, any economist will tell you that during any business uh, upturn, uh, that most job growth comes from small businesses, not the big corporations. And, real, and the last point is very important because uh, this will be a tough one for people used to the aerospace and government way of doing things, of thinking that you know, we can plan and program everything. Um, when you get into doing real facilities, there's a limit to which you cannot plan them beyond a certain point. The Soviets tried that and it didn't work out for them. Next, please. And here's another one I just want to go on a sidetrack of because it's a very deep cultural bias that we have in the West is that there's only two sides to any question. You do one thing or you do the other thing. This is wired very deeply into our politics, into how journalism is practiced, much of our thinking on most issues. You know, journalists are actually trained to do this in J school. If somebody is saying something, they go out and get a person to disagree with them, and then they think they've got both sides of the issue. Well, there might be some other side. You know, there's the right hand and the left hand, but then there's the gripping hand. It's frequently there. Uh, Okay, how, here's a test. Science fiction literacy. How many people understand why I'm referring to the gripping hand? Okay, more of you need to read Niven and Pornell. Uh, very good book, The Moat in God's Eye. It's one of the finest science fiction novels ever written um, in which they, he postulates a species that has three hands and not two. They've got the right hand, the left hand, and the gripping hand. And it affects everything about their psychology, how they approach technology. It, it actually makes them rather difficult to deal with. In the first novel of the, of the series of two, humans don't succeed very well dealing with these people. So add that to your summer reading list, The Moat in God's Eye by Niven and Pornell. You won't regret it. Onwards. Because in a, in a lot of the thinking and the discussion I've been hearing about this, they're going back and forth about, well, will the government do this or will private companies do it? But we're ignoring a whole sector there, a sector that's getting bigger with every donation, every endowment, uh, which is the whole sector of nonprofit organizations. It's a very healthy sector in our civilization, and it's getting bigger. Uh, thanks to Warren Buffett and the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, it's getting a lot bigger in a hurry. Um, uh, Ted Turner showed the way on this about 10 to 15 years ago, and it's, it's really starting to take off. And we may want the, and there's actually, and, and I hope to hear back from some of the attorneys in here, I think that the, uh, the actual owners and developers of the Lunar Settlement, it may be better if they're nonprofits for reasons having to do with the Outer Space Treaty. Next one. Okay, if you're going into de development economics 101, you have to think anchor tenants, especially for government involvement in the settlement, particularly for NASA because they don't want to stay there long term. You identify all the key players at the planning stage, not after the fact. You know, that's a well duh, but it's not always been done. Certainly wasn't done with the ISS. You have to leave room for infill and for entrepreneurial enterprises and for small business. There's, and this would be another tough one for people trained in the aerospace way of solving problems. 
there isn't going to be an optimum design for the settlement. You want to leave room for it to grow. You want to have an agora that small businesses can come in. Somebody's going to want to do the first Starbucks. Nobody down on earth is going to decide that. Somebody's going to step forward and do it if you leave the space. Next, please. How many minutes? I can't quite see in the light. Oh, no. Okay, I'll wrap up. So we can, I'll wrap this up very quickly. Um, we can identify some very useful roles for government. This is not a libertarian tirade you're hearing from me. Government has a very useful role to play. Uh, setting standards, rules, building codes, uh, guaranteed early markets for the products. Uh, the only place we can get stable, a stable legal regime is from government. Sadly, we will have to have courts if there are people. We can't shoot all the lawyers, no matter what Will Shakespeare said. Um, you know, this is a sad, it's a reality. Next, please. Next slide. Uh, establishing the key infrastructure, particularly in, in a location where there is no natural biosphere to fall back on, uh, the core life support is going to have to be a, a, a function of, of the facility operator. That would either be the foundation that owns the thing, if we go that path, or government. Uh, operation and regulation of the useful utilities and standards for their expansion. You know, these are useful roles for government. Uh, also, if anybody actually builds a mass driver for delivery of products from the moon, you can bet there's going to have to be public control of that one. Uh, anyone who doubts that needs to read another science fiction novel, The Moon is Dangerous. <laughs> Keep going. There's some very clear private sector roles, though, and these are just a few of them. This is just a sampling. I put in bold transportation services because um, my guess from what I know, obser observing this field since about 92, and uh, just seeing what's happening so fast on the transportation side, my guess is by, by the time NASA are ready to go back to the moon, the private sector will have already done it faster, better, and cheaper. Um, and you know, they're going to be there earlier uh, because they're going to find ways to make money doing it. Keep going, please. And then the nonprofit sector is a very, very useful sector to engage in all this. And there's a whole, particularly for the long-term science missions, really long-term science. Uh, it's not appropriate that NASA run that. There's other scientific organizations here in this country and around the world will need to engage in that. Carry on, please. So in summary, I just want to say we need to examine all the assumptions. We don't fall into the trap of dualistic thinking. We look at all our options. Leave room for evolution. You know, real frontiers are a little messy. They're a lot of fun, but it's going to be messy. It's not going to be programmed down tightly. And, you know, freedom is a very precious thing. We need to export that to the moon, too along with everything else we take along. And I'd say one more thing I want to add in on this, because just from the back and forth within some of these committees, I'm in the committee Wendell referred to, the LEAG process, I'm involved in that, the word we really need to fight to put is the word settlement. That is the battleground word. And as you all know, words matter. Words carry meaning. And, and words have power. And settlement is the word we're going to have to defend. Thank you. Are you ready for any questions? At this point, I'd like to hold questions until we have the entire presentation. So I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Mahadevan to come up. Hello, my name is Sankaran Mahadevan. Uh, I am at Vanderbilt University, uh, Civil Engineering Department. I also direct a program, a doctoral program funded by National Science Foundation on reliability and risk engineering and management, uh, which uh, has a lot of uh, overlap and interface with many of the issues that we deal with in meetings such as this, which is the risk and reliability of various types of operations and missions. And uh, I, the here is as one of the members of the executive committee of the aerospace uh, division of the American Society of Civil Engineers. As Kevin mentioned, we are going through a, a strategic planning exercise right now. and. Uh, in fact, this, uh, our participation in this meeting and interaction with uh, some of you is going to be very valuable uh, as we define our role in this nonprofit organization, uh, apart from government and private sector entities. Next one, please. So uh, among all the engineering disciplines, uh, civil engineers' role is very broad, of course. Uh, uh, two bullets. Uh, try to capture everything that we do. We want to build facilities that humans can use, and then we want to protect the environment that we live in. Uh, this, of course, uh, means a lot of different things. Uh, so we bring uh, to the table uh, many different areas of expertise, uh, such as 
habitat, habitat planning and design, architecture, facilities, and infrastructure, uh, design and engineering, and uh, specifically, more specifically, if we get into it, structures, design, engineering, then geotechnical and foundations, construction, uh, and we, in fact, uh, this is interesting. C civil engineering is so broad, we even include things such as, uh, uh, you know, systems engineering and commerce and and uh, even law and policy. Uh, life support systems is uh, one of our concerns. Uh, of course, water supply and wastewater treatment is part of that. And also uh, mining issues connected with geotechnical materials both in terms of materials for building facilities and also materials that we are excavating and mining from uh, these different uh, uh, bases. And also, uh, remote sensing that connects with that and also, in general, civil engineers are uh, broad systems integrators and we bring in lots of different types of systems, very large systems, and uh, how do we integrate them and uh, make them work together. So. We feel that uh, there is, a, a, as uh, many of you here who have concerns with the commercial and uh, development and settlement aspects of uh, uh, space exploration, uh, we uh, civil engineers have a big role to play in uh, both in terms of uh, managing, integrating a lot of different facilities and building them and making them operate in uh, new and uh, harsh environments. Next one, please. Uh, of course, uh, the clients for our activities are government, private entities, and nonprofit spec sector. ASC itself is a nonprofit organization. And uh, the scope of our activities that we are considering uh, in this particular division, of course, uh, includes the moon, Mars, and asteroids, operations, and, and mining, and so on. And also, one very important thing is. Uh, uh, our concerns are twofold. We actually operate at the interface between aerospace and civil engineering. So our concerns are also in, not only in terms of uh, helping with space exploration and development operations, but also transferring technology from space operations back to uh, applications in planet Earth. And uh, also in uh, supporting space operations, we need to build facilities infrastructure on the earth, such as spaceports and so on. So that's uh, been one of our concerns also. And also some of our uh, committees are looking into futuristic uh, projects, such as the uh, space elevator. I'll say a bit about it later, laser launch and so on. So we, uh, we do cover the, uh, uh, quite a wide spectrum of uh, interests within the topic of space exploration. Next one. So, Given this broad uh, context, the aerospace division in ASCE, our mission is to foster research, incubate technologies, and also promote education and technology transfer, as I said, in the interface between aerospace and civil engineering. We do this through our various committees, and uh, I have listed here uh, the seven committees that uh, are currently within our division. Space engineering and construction was, in fact, the first of these committees which in fact grew into this division, so to speak. And in fact, this committee uh, organized our uh, Earth and Space conferences, uh, and then it became uh, much more a, wide, uh, a wider spectrum. And uh, one minute. Yeah. And you have all these other committees that are much more hardcore uh, technical uh, committees. And also you see two more at the bottom, which is space architecture, uh, which concerns with habitat planning and design and also life support systems, uh, environmental uh, support, and so on, uh, which involves environmental engineers. So we have been conducting these earth and space conferences for the past 20 years. And uh, I just wanted to give you a, a, a brief idea of what, what we just had uh, in 2006, March in Houston. And uh, we also included a, a granular material workshop, uh, which is a, uh, connected with mining and also in-situ resource uh, utilization and also building foundations and mechanics and tunneling and so on in uh, lunar and Martian surfaces. And also a uh, space architecture workshop was part of that. We, are, we always have a robotics competition for students uh, for operations in lunar and Martian environments. 
and so on. And uh, you can see uh, many of the conference tracks cover both uh, technical uh, hardcore engineering uh, topics as well as uh, more uh, development and commerce and uh, planning and systems engineering type uh, topics as well. And uh, we also are actively uh, pursuing liaisons with other conferences such as the Responsive Access to Space Conference and Mars Technical Mars Society and Habitation Conference. We, had, in fact, we are uh, uh, talking to the Habitation Conference folks, which uh, deal with a lot with life support systems, to come and uh, uh, join uh, in our 2008 conference. Uh, next one, which is the last one, in fact. Okay. Uh, we also have other uh, divisions and institutes within ASCE that uh, we collaborate with depending on the uh, topics, uh, engineering and construction and transportation and so on. So you can see that ASC is offering a wide variety of opportunities uh, for collaboration and research and education technology transfer. And uh, the purpose for us being here, here uh, with you all is to actually inform our strategic planning exercise uh, so that uh, we, we want to expand our portfolio from just technical subjects to also uh, issues of uh, commerce and policy and uh, development and settlement. And uh, also uh, want to recruit your participation in, uh, in our activities such as, uh, let's say, our upcoming conference in 2008 which will be in Los Angeles where we want to expand our sessions from just technical topics to also business and law and policy and other related topics. So thank you for your attention and I look forward to and my colleagues, both me and my colleagues look forward to talking with you all one on one over these next two days to gather your ideas about how we can serve you uh, the civil engineering community much better in this endeavor. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, our proceedings, uh, some of us are lucky to have pretty much a full set back to 88. Uh, I know John Connolly at NASA mentioned a couple years ago that he has to guard his uh, set down at Johnson very carefully because they tend to disappear. Uh, you can go on, the, on our organization's website, ASCE.org, click on publications and do a search. And I think of our past 10 conferences, seven of the proceedings are still available. And they do cover, uh, over the years we've covered just about everything. Uh, no, what we're, what we're working on a systematic process to do is to reach out to all the areas of our profession, a, a very vast membership with uh, very diverse areas of interest, and get them engaged in this process, not only for projects on the moon, but also further on on Mars or on the asteroids, wherever there are useful facilities to be built. So, I mean, the moon will probably be the first thing, but that's just the start of it. So, no. Looking at the moon, what... What building materials would you use? Uh, let's see. Several have been postulated that you can in there. There are ways you can do lunar concrete, particularly if you use uh, sulfur as a binder rather than water. That's been studied fairly extensively. Uh, there's been some theorizing that we could use cast basalt, though there are some problems on casting pieces large enough to be useful for structural members. I've done a paper or two on that myself. Uh, you know, there's a variety, and we can also center blocks out of the regolith for unpressurized structures. Uh, and there's a variety of metals, and we've literally scratched the surface on the moon. Uh, the mineral resources up there, particularly the metallic resources, may be quite extensive and provide us everything we need. Uh, we certainly have the energy, at least 14 days out of every 28, we have energy for processing coming much more freely than here. Yeah, there's a very 
silicate content in some of the lunar regolith. So yeah, there, we need to get up there and work out just how to process those materials. That's the whole ISRU process that's been uh, worked on by people, various researchers. Quite a few, in fact. And uh, in, in my opinion, I think there's going to be enough up there, yes. So, okay, let's imagine we're making glass and we're making solar panels and mm -hmm. So you've got these things, they can be built on the moon, you can have structures in which people can live, you can have an industrial infrastructure on the moon in order to produce these useful materials which you don't have to send back to Earth, you can use in space. Um, and then the task is to develop, as Las Vegas had once developed, uh, a community around its gambling casinos. Then the time comes to build the community uh, in which people live. Does that sound accurate? Yes, That's the, that is the model. But yeah, our, as I said in my presentation, a real communities and real economies evolve. Right. I mean, Las, modern Las Vegas with you know, the huge development on the Strip started right here at the Flamingo. It's a building that no, long, no longer exists. It got buried by this newer and bigger building we're in now. But this was, this was Bugsy's joint here, 1946, 47. This was the first big new casino built. Uh, you know, the old downtown, stuff going back to the 30s, but this was the first new model cas casino resort that set the model for everything that's happened on the Strip since. It was only 50 years ago. Look around you. Right. Look what's grown. And out away from the Strip, I mean, I live here. There's a nice, beautiful, pleasant city to live in out away from the Strip that most of you don't see if you just come here for the weekend. Well, let me ask one Go more ahead. question. Go yeah, one more. Um, I hate to hog all this time, but one of the things that we've been debating is whether you could, let me give you the science fiction scenario and you tell me the reality of that. Okay. Um, material can be lifted from the moon into lunar orbit with relative ease because of low gravity. Mm -hmm. Lift lots and lots and lots of material yep, to, an, in, to uh, an industrial infrastructure in lunar orbit. Now, put together for me something the size of this building plus the two buildings next to it as a space vehicle to carry a community of between 1,000 and 10,000 people, build it out of glass because people love sunlight, mm -hmm. um, build it out of glass because radiation is a huge problem and because you can make radiation proof glass, it's being done right now mm -hmm. on Earth. Put anything you want on the bottom from sparklers to ion um, propulsion systems and move it toward Mars. Um, push it into Martian orbit, mm -hmm. open, open yeah. the doors, and then let the private landing vehicles or the public landing vehicles depart at will. Mm -hmm. Pick up fuel on, the moon, on Mars because there's lots of water there, so fuel is much easier to come by. Yeah. And let them fly back, not necessarily to the vehicle that took them there, but to another 10,000. Yeah. <coughs> sure. Is this science fiction or is this civil engineering in space? It is, uh, it is actually uh, becoming more and more uh, engineering. Uh, it's a question of concern for engineers. In fact, uh, that reminds me, just to the last conference we had, we had a whole session on water extraction in Mars. So technical issues and what might be the technologies that might uh, bring that to fruition. Without water, that's very so important. So these issues are becoming more and more within the scope of engineering research. We had a hand I up think last uh, we question. Are, yeah. okay, we, had, we had a hand up here in the for last. One. Yes. Um, hi, my name is Vijal Thakur of International Space University and X Prize Foundation. Um, really interested that you mentioned that nonprofit foundations should be um, eligible for ownership of settlements. Mm -hmm. My first question would be, what type of time scales are we looking at? Because you mentioned large, um, on a grander scale, type settlements. What what My guess is it would happen faster than people can imagine right now. It all depends how much investment there is and how quickly the business plans close, which depends on your transportation costs. So I wouldn't want to give a number of years on it now, except that pay, based on the past history of this kind of thing and, and the way our species has been accomplishing things the last couple centuries, it'll happen faster than 
skeptics would, uh, would guess. It's going to surprise a lot of people. Perhaps not many in this room, but um, it'll surprise a lot of people in the rest of the world. And we, I, we're, we're getting the time hack from our, uh, from our yeah. yes. Okay. Thank you. So if time. you could save your other questions for through the conference, we'll be here and, uh, and be very willing to talk with you through the rest of the conference. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now it's time for a break. Uh, if you could be back in here by 10.30.